Boa tarde a todos. Seguimos hoje com o Festival Zoom 2020, esse ano totalmente online, por causa da pandemia. Ontem a gente viu, na abertura do festival, uma aula aberta com a historiadora Lilia Schwartz e uma conversa entre a artista Rosana Paulino e a filósofa Denise Ferreira da Silva. E o festival segue hoje, às cinco, depois dessa mesa, com Alfredo Jaar conversando com Tiago Nogueira, editor da Zoom, e amanhã com Tereza Margolis e Gabriela Rangel, e às três horas, e Denilson Baniwa com Ailton Krenak, às cinco. É, a programação completa está no site da Zoom e todas as mesas ficam gravadas no canal de YouTube da revista. Podem ser acessadas a qualquer momento depois dos debates. Todos os debates contam com intérprete em libras e as mesas em língua estrangeira, como essa, têm tradução simultânea. Né? A nossa equipe postou é, o link para a sala com áudio traduzido no chat. É, e, por fim, é, introduzindo os convidados na mesa, é, a gente está lançando no festival a Zoom 19, a última edição da revista Zoom, com um lindo ensaio da artista norte-americana Carmen Winant, a partir do seu livro Notes on Fundamental Joy, Notas sobre a Alegria Fundamental. É, a Carmen é escritora e artista, é autora do livro My Birth, Meu Parto, publicado pela Self-Published Be Happy em 2018, além de Notas sobre a Alegria Fundamental, publicado pela Printed Matter em 2019. É a sua exposição mais recente, Togethering, no Fortnite Institute, em Nova York, trata de intimidade, de coletividade, de representação das mulheres e do corpo feminino, que é um tema constante no trabalho dela. E para conversar com a Carmen, a gente tem o prazer de contar com a curadora sênior de fotografia do Museu de Arte Moderna de Nova York, a Roxana Marcossi. A Marcossi preside o Grupo de Perspectivas de Arte Contemporânea e Moderna para a Europa Central e Oriental do MoMA e colabora com diversas publicações, como a Aperture, Art in America, Art Journal, Moose e muitas outras. Eu queria agradecer imensamente a Carmen e a Roxana e desejar a todos um bom debate. Thank you, Carmen, Roxana. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to move right into sharing my screen. Um, so hopefully I won't have any trouble with this. Um, let's see. Can you, I'm gonna, can you see this okay, everybody? Okay, great. Um, so I'll be sort of reading from my notes and moving back and forth, hopefully in a way that feels as seamless as possible over the computer. I'd like to begin by thanking Tiago for inviting me. We first met last December in London um, at a conference at the Tate before the world collapsed. Um, and for Roni for facilitating and of course for Roxana for being in conversation. I've mentioned this to Roxana in emails leading up to this event, but her curatorial work has really helped to shape my own understanding of really what experimental feminist photographic practice can be and look like. And for that, I am really grateful. So there's a few things I'd like to establish at the outset before moving into the slides. I want to start um, by echoing Roni and saying that I am an artist and a sometimes writer. I'm not an art historian. Um, and as such, this presentation will proceed as something like an experimental essay in which the photographs describe the text as much as the other way around. So in other words, um, that there's no sort of implicit hierarchy or scaffolding or sort of um, manner in which language serves as explanation for, for image. I will not be showing you my photographs. I do not make my own photographs and haven't for about, uh, well, well over a decade. My creative practice pivots on photographic objects that are produced by others, which I work to find, compound, and recontextualize. So today I will be speaking about a specific photographic history, in other words, one that I did not author, but consider maybe in some oblique way to be of and through my work. The photographs that I will be showing resulted in an artist book that Roni mentioned, um, which is abbreviated to Notes on Fundamental Joy. It has a slightly longer title. 
um, which was published by Printed Matter in New York last summer. And my focus today, I, I really want to emphasize, will be on the pictures themselves rather than the container that is the book. Although you'll see that I sort of toggle back and forth. And this strategy of um, really focusing the, the pictures themselves as the work rather than my revisitation upon them, um, you'll see a sort of reinforced over and over and is a meaningful one. I, I won't arrive at this again until the end, but sort of one meaningful conversation here is my own role um, in this revisitation. Um, am I interlocutor, uh, intruder, or both? And so with that, I will begin. Um, Roxana, could you see the slide move? I just want to make sure. Yes, OK, thank you. Is it possible to leave everything behind? Is it possible to begin again, outside of and beyond every system of living that you've ever known and been conditioned inside of, reinventing what it means and looks like to exist as a body and its soul on the land? Now that you know, can you ever go back now that your consciousness has been indelibly raised. I will be speaking today about that great unflagging American ideal, Manifest Destiny. In the early 1970s, thousands of women left their homes and in some cases their families to move west to Oregon, Washington, parts of California and New Mexico and build out and live in intentional agrarian communities that they named women's lands, and that's women with a YN, that disallowed the presence of men. On the left, I might mention, um, you can see the artist book. The full title of the artist book is shown here in caption, but I'll read it out loud nonetheless. Notes on fundamental joy, seeking the elimination of oppression through the social and political transformation of the patriarchy that otherwise threatens to bury us. My apologies to the translator. Capitalism, the most patriarchal of enterprises, was likewise disbanded. Instead, these communities embraced to varying degrees, I may mention, and across varying strategies, a model of shared property, lovers, finances, governance, and the general hardships of rural existence. The women, many who came into feminism well after getting married and having children, often arrived with very little knowledge about how to work and live off the land, how to build structures to live inside of, how to irrigate, run electricity, how to dispose of human waste. They, th they taught themselves and they invented too. Language in particular was reimagined to match their new lives. Menstruation became moonstration I'm not sure how you translate that. Seminars became ovulars. Women became women, as I said, with a YN. History became herstory. Fathers' surnames were dropped in favor of new taken last names that reflected their lands. Osmer became Newhouse. Johnson became Freedom. Smith became Hillwoman, and that's woman um, O-N. Eichler became Mountain Grove. Here was a new or newly rediscovered model that refigured and rejected the trappings of male domination. These women sought intellectual idealism, creative freedom, and fundamental joy. And, and this is all their language, I might add. And refused to capitulate to or compromise with a system that did them unrelenting harm. They simply left it behind in favor of building an entirely new world. What does that feel like? And what engenders is promise? I've looked at these photographs for a long time now, years, in attempt to mine the gap in understanding and experience between my own life as a cisgendered, heterosexual identifying feminist and mother of two young sons and the lives of these women who I've come to know through their pictures and documents, some of them produced nearly half a century ago, 
In the process, I romanticize these pictures, these communities. I can't help it. I acknowledge my own backwards looking tendencies and work to absorb them into the project. The archival images that you've been looking at are by Ruth and Jean Mountain Grove, T. Corinne, Honey Lee Cottrell, Jeb, um, Je Joan E. Byron, often known as Jeb, Clydia Fuller, Katie Niles, and Carol Newhouse. They are sourced from personal collections, which is to say women's closets underneath their beds, their basements, and from institutional ones, as with the Cornell University's rare book and manuscript collection, which houses the Honey Lee Cottrell collection, and from the Lesbian Land Manuscript Special Collection at the University of Oregon, which is unlike any other institutional archive I've ever seen. And you can see um, demonstratively on the left, the book, this is the middle of the book, the colophon fell in the middle of the book, and you can see some of the credits uh, for just, you know, just a handful of the images that appeared. Some of these women have passed away. Many are still living, and some have bec become involved with the project in different ways. Together, they offer a glimpse into something extraordinary the drive to actualize a feminist world. Where to begin? When I teach feminism as an ideological structure and as a political movement to art students, I always foreground the questions, can feminism exist within capitalism? And can you in fact imagine occupying a non-patriarchal world? Imagination of course being, um, you know, the pivotal word. Increasingly, I find that my students have trouble grasping the very premise of these interrelated prompts. They do not know what I mean, really, in the suggestion that there are other ways to organize and validate our lives. This cannot be the result simply of that which they do not know. After all, these women, the women we're looking at here, didn't know, hadn't glimpsed, anything but the paternalistic. And so it must be something deeper, something more specific to our generation, something like a foreclosed sense of optimism, which is, in my opinion, the decisive tool of radical action. One must be willing to believe, unseen, that they have the collective agency to change the terms of their world. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the German rationalist, defined optimism as the world that is best possible among worlds. Surely we must be able to not only imagine an alternative, a world among worlds, but to truly believe in its possibility before staking our very lives on its premise. And so more than the idea of idealism or utopia, God forbid, it is this sense of optimism, how it is pictured and the ways in which it becomes lost between generations and in between lives that drives my inquiry. What in other words, does it actually look like? To quote the Canadian writer and curator, Sophie Hackett on the subject, does optimism have an aesthetic? And you can see here, I might add um, in the pages of the book, were printed on a semi-transparent paper. Um, the idea being that there would be some kind of continuity or continuous bleed between the recto and the verso of either page. You know, a small but meaningful subversion to um, the rigidity with how we read books and sort of understand images and sequence. Perhaps most germane to our gathering, I hope to demonstrate here, and I realize this is a sort of unconventional um, artist talk, the role of photography within this particular history as certain and expansive. My research has been centered specifically on the ovulars, a series of photographic workshops offered on several different separatist com uh, communities, and I should add they, um, rejected the word commune from 1981 to 84. 
Ovulars, of course, is another renaming and reclaiming, in this case of the word seminar, the etymological meaning of which is literally to spread seed or semen. So of course, that would be less than relevant here. There is a nice near rhyme um, too with the word ocular, which has one letter difference from ovular. Ocular, of course, is a word that um, is directly connected with the eyes or sort of requires a literal usage of the eye muscles. And you may also note, although it's sort of hard to see in the smaller image, my essay running across the bottom of the book, um, it runs across the bottom of every page as a sort of continuous line, hearkening back perhaps to what I said at the outset about a kind of de destabilizing our expectations um, you know, of, of text or the sort of hierarchy between text and image. I'm always thinking about how to trouble, trouble that relationship of explanation um, and, and knowledge making, frankly. I was also thinking formally here about um, the, a kind of a formal manifestation of optimism and manifest destiny um, and thinking about a really a low lying horizon line and a big sky in some sense and um, sort of the sense of moving westward and the mythology that we have of that in the United States, sort of um, this empty space of what could be. Uh, here is a photo of Jeb, uh, the incredible um, in inimitable uh, photographer, uh, Joni Byron, of an ovular schedule. So you can see the names of T, Jeb, Ruth, Carol, and Clydia orienting women on how to use a four by five camera, how to print in a dark room, how to develop color film, how to create photo erotica, how to conceive of exhibits, a magazine, and publish their photography work. So as you can see, quite a range, um, you know, of kinds of, um, of kinds of classes, of, you know, sort of subclass, sub ovulars. T. Corinne, who is pictured here in the center, is one of um, the either four to six organizer midwives, as they were called, really the facilitators and originators of, of the workshops. And she wrote later, some decades later of the experience, and this is to quote Corinne, the ovulars were the kind of place where women could come together and experience community, where questions could be freely asked, information shared and ideas generated. They were structured for support and against competition and took place in an isolated woodland setting with low tech facilities. Darkroom electricity was supplied by marine battery slideshows were powered by a gas fuel generator. Participants camped, used an outhouse, bathed using, using stream water heated by the sun and shared cooking responsibilities. In this supportive atmosphere, we stretched to include new areas of women's experience and thoughtfully, sometimes self-consciously broke taboos. And I'm continuing here with the Corinne quote. We asked, how has the women's movement changed the way we see? And I might add in that one sentence, I feel that Corinne has um, so aptly summarized, you know, my whole life's inquiry. Okay, so go, just go back to her language here. What kinds of photos are being produced and published now that have not been seen before? What are the realities of our shapes and our lives? What are the differences between the ways men have pictured women and the ways we see ourselves? end quote. Here you can see their photography studio, which is quite crudely built on rootworks in uh, one of uh, where the ovulars took place in, in Southern Oregon. Pictures always hung low, rarely in straight or single lines. And it's common, as you can see here, that they hung from the ceiling. This photograph resembles sort of no um, yeah, no photo studio, at least that I have ever, or classroom that I have ever worked in before. And critically, they photographed the process, making pictures of making pictures. More than the photographs they produced, this has been, or rather as a part of the photographs that they produced, this has been the locus of my interest, the desire to capture the approach to documenting itself. They were teaching each other anew how to see 
and be seen. You may also notice it's sort of unmissable, the emphasis on nudity in these pictures and across these communities. They were by no means nudist, but at least I suspect this lack of clothing describes a general state of threatlessness. It is a way I might presume to discard shame, occupy desire and embody the very terms of their liberation. I cannot so easily comprehend a photograph of a nude woman that is not either hypersexualized or used to sell something, be it a product or an attitude. It surprises me every time. Looking at these photographs, I wonder, how does it feel to live without the looming threat of sexual, sexual violence, harassment, trauma, or coercion, without occupying a body that is, excuse me, occupying a body that is neither a weapon nor a target. And I might add, it's just so amazing to see a situation in which the photographer is every bit as nude as her subject. The result of this is sort of funny and tender and entirely demonstrative of their anti-hierarchical ethos. Here is total equivalence. This strategy, if we can call it that, of letting go is evidenced in this sign uh, by Ruth Mountain Grove, which speaks among other things of a ritualistic burn, a mourning ritual in which clothing and other objects um, that women came to the land with were ritualistically burned in a purifying fire upon arrival. I don't know if that's what we're looking at here, but I've always imagined I've always imagined this to be sort of connected to that sign. Um, and same with, same with these images, although this fire doesn't seem particularly robust. And I might add too, these photographs, these series of photographs, um, just for example, were taken by two different people, um, right? Either at the same scene or a sort of recurring scenes. And it's a really, um, it's really been part of the joy for me of this project is to tease out the connecting sort of tissue between archives and sort of imagine and sort of continue to reimagine who is in the room and sort of, and their, their very positioning. And so we are brought back to the politics of picture making itself. Why the overwhelming insistence between dozens of such dedicated lesbian separatist communities on photography as a device Jeb has accounted for the ability of photography to act as affirmation and testimony. And she, she has said, because relatives and others destroyed the evidence of lesbian lives, and because many photographers had to stay closeted in order to survive or make a living in prior times, there was not a lot of overt evidence, end quote. There was, in other words, a need to substantiate that which had been erased. Here is one of those photographs of um, the photographer and subject, Lynn Reynolds, whom we see also in the last series, um, across the last slide, and photographs made by Carol Newhouse. And Lynn, I might add, um, as I'm sure you can see, is one of the few women of color, um, at least who participated in the Avilars on um, root works. And it appears here placed to, um, next to a photograph of pressed photograph, excuse me, of pressed butterflies made by Honey Mukachel. Distinct from the power of photography to affirm their individual narratives, it offers something else here in the collective, an ability to prove that such world building was possible and actualized that it might exist in perpetuity as a set of instructions, which is at least how I read these photographs, more than evidence, or at least in addition to evidence of that which had already occurred. In other words, these are pictures with the potential to teach. And of course, the photographs, which are women picturing women, um, needless to say, are recalibrations of desire. 
photography, both still and moving, so long used as a tool to project male desire upon and through female bodies, is destabilized and reclaimed by these women and in these ovulars. It is part of the reason, surely, that they insist on picturing one another behind the camera so many times over. I might add one last thought on this um, too, that I think it's a little bit more nuanced than a kind of a simple subversion of the male gaze, not that that's ever simple. Um, these photographs, I think, too, deal in something that Bell Hooks, um, the great American, uh, you know, public intellectual, um, has coined the oppositional gaze. Now, she was thinking and writing about that in relation to Black narrative cinema. So I'm sort of coaching it here uh, for my needs, but it, it deals in, it's a, um, as she defines it, and, I, and I'm, I'm not quoting her here directly, it's an active form of resistance and it encompasses both, mo both modes of looking and most importantly, looking back. So in other words, not only being looked upon. So I sort of co-opted that here. Um, I just have a few more slides. This is an important photograph I wanted to include for what it shows. Uh, both Ruth and Jean Mountain Grove, who are sort of the, um, uh, the grandmothers of this exercise. They, are, they were longtime creative and romantic partners, although at the time they would have been described as mating. They were the mothers of adult children. And as I've mentioned, they initiated much of the photography sort of happening across this, this community, Rootworks and others. Um, some, some folks may be familiar with the Blatant Image, a magazine that they started uh, incredible magazine, there are only three issues, and subsequent photographic based magazines, including Woman's Spirit. Here we see Ruth Mountaingrove on the left in her early 70s and Jeb um, in her early 30s. Here again, Ruth Mountaingrove, whose archives of, whose archive of photographs at the University of Oregon exceeds 950 photographic objects. And a few pages from T. Curran's, um, what she called her scrapbook. These are really photographs of photographs of photographs that unfortunately I couldn't include in the book, but um, I love them so, um, in which she's been created a scene together document of her own studio and, um, and sort of workspace, which is a, a sort of another um, sub and meta interest of, of my own sort of artists, you know, in, investigating the spaces in which they themselves work. I'd like to end on a series of photographs of women getting haircuts, a ritual of sorts, which was often performed in a non-obligatory you know, way when women first arrived on these communities. I was struck by the number of haircut photographs that I encountered in these archives. Understanding that, well, I didn't understand this initially. I really sort of only understood at the end that it might be a way to alter and mark one's body immediately and without harm to sort of quote the, um, the, the sign earlier to speak the story of our loss and to shed the dead weight. In fact, the, a crop of those two images appeared on the cover of the book, which you're seeing on the left. And um, it was a sort of, um, it was a tender sort of and private decision on my part to make a connection with the last book that I produced that was also mentioned called My Birth. That book ended um, with what I thought was kind of a nuanced and also private feeling photograph of a woman looking at herself in a small handheld mirror after giving birth. This notion of recognition, of self-recognition, sort of at the very moment like the moment that the qualitative self is transforming is really at the center of everything for me. And so I liked the idea that one book could end with, you know, with this image of a woman looking at herself in the mirror and sort of moment of transformation. And that the next book could begin sort of with that similar gesture if taken from another perspective. Finally, and this is my last slide. Notes on Fundamental Joy is an honorific research project about feminist actualization 
about the oppositional gaze, about the harnessing of radical optimism. In ways that I don't have time to talk about today, it is also a project about the arguable failings of these profoundly essentialist communities and my own place inside of all of it as a person for whom a lesbian history can't be claimed. The more I talk about and show this research and the work that has come from it, the more I am confronted with difficult and meaningful questions that I imagine will come up in our sort of question and answer section about permission, inheritance, and authority. These are not questions that I hope to resolve. They're not questions I know how to resolve, um, nor that are really possible to. Instead, and relatedly, I continue to face the beauty of these pictures and contend with their need to be made and make themselves. And I might add that this is a photograph of Honey Lee Cottrell made of herself um, years after leaving the land um, in a barber shop, in a men's barber shop in San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, it's such a treat to actually uh, look at these images and hear you speak and see it through your eyes. Um, and thank you so much, Thiago and Ronnie for, uh, for creating this event. Um, I am going just to perhaps start this conversation by um, reiterating some of the main points that you mentioned and then beginning to set up the grounds for a series of questions. And I would like to invite um, those who are here, the other guests to also continue sending their own questions. Uh, a few have already arrived. Um, you mentioned that Notes on Fundamental Joy uh, or rather begins with an image that is uh, so close to the one um, with which my birth closes. And to me, I think that we are talking about two uh, manifesto here works in a certain way that are positioned at the cross section of feminist political philosophy and also historical document. And it's interesting because in my birth, you are drawing upon your own experience as a mother, as a daughter, and also upon the intersectional and intergenerational experiences of so many other women by uh, bringing together or assembling and also recontextualizing material from these unconventional archives, but also by making visible the unknowable and unspoken experience of birth. Now in notes on fundamental joy, you are, as you mentioned, not drawing on your own experience, but rather you are seeking an ideal, a sense of optimism, um, a patriarchy free world building model. So in another words, an opportunity here to rethink the future. And you showed us and you have spoken here of uh, how you mix together the photographs made uh, by lesbian feminists during the ovular workshops in the book. Um, you haven't mentioned, but if you look at the book, then you would see that all the artist credits are gathered uh, on a single page. And that in itself resonates with the idea of communion, of solidarity, uh, reflecting on this collective structure of that group. You have also mentioned their relationship to the land, to ritual and queer desire. And it's really beautiful to hold that book in your hands because it is true the pages that are printed on a thin translucent paper allow the traces of the photographs to kind of infiltrate uh, the next pages to amplify that layering uh, that you also mentioned and the fusion of images. And then you also mentioned that the text aligned and at the same time disconnected from the images runs along uh, the bottom of each page. 
in a single line. And when you began your talk, you started by uh, quoting yourself. And I love the way that this book starts with a question, with a question, is it possible to leave everything behind? And why? Why, why one may ask, in fact, why leave everything behind? And of course, it becomes clear that it is in order to reimagine what it means uh, to exist in a society where the violence of patriarchy and the violence of capital have been dispelled in favor of a shared model of love, property, and governance. What you didn't mention is how uh, you end the book and uh, the text ends uh, with an affirmation and a question. Uh, it says, I'm a traveler here. Am I a traveler here? So you make an assertion and you also ask a question about your own positioning as a heterosexual cisgendered artist in rapport to a non-normative feminist history, uh, which in fact opens a whole set of pertinent questions about gender and power. And these questions are also brought up um, somewhat in Ariel Goldsberg's essay. So my first question is, what drew you first and foremost to this alternative community as opposed to any other one? Wow, well, first of all, thank you for that, Roxana. I, I'm not sure that I could do any better in talking about the, the book, the sort of, you know, um, the complications, the nuances, the desire um, that fuels the project. So I really appreciate that astute reading. Um, it's interesting after I, for me at least, after I finished my birth, the project that we just alluded to at MoMA, of course, where you work, that was a book project and also an installation. I, um, I was thinking about you know, how, how I could move from that project into another project that would be as meaningful, as generative, as problematic in certain ways, sort of what that trajectory could look like. And so it might, um, the sort of connective tissue between projects might not be so apparent I'm sort of on the face of things, but as you and I have emailed about Roxana, for me, um, it was quite intentional to move from thinking about one form of family making, which is biological family making, to another, which is social um, and really socio-political family making, which is what was happening here. Um, and of course, using photography to sort of interrogate, um, you know, and affirm both modes of family making. And so I just want to say at the outset that for me, that point of connection between projects, which happened in subsequent years, 2018 and 2019, although they're ongoing in their own ways, um, is a really, it's a really meaningful thread between them. Um, and it's really been feminists, you know, and, and queer people and thinkers who have, of course, educated me to this idea of, you know, the potential of family making um, and what it means to continue to refashion family, um, right? Not just sort of at these, in these heteronormative ways. So I was, that was already on my mind. Um, I've known about these photographs for years. Um, I came into them for the first time, in fact, oh, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 years ago, when I read an article in The New Yorker by uh, the writer Ariel Levy, who's writing about the Van Dykes, um, who was sort of a self-described gypsy group of, of lesbian feminist separatists traveling up and down the West Coast. And um, it really, as I think I, as I hope I alluded to, it blew me wide open. I think for a lot of us, um, well, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but for me, I've had the experience several times over um, in my creative life and intellectual life that I come into an articulated idea or problem or question um, that feels so central to, you know, to my project. And there it is, right? Like I just, I sort of had to circle and circle until I found it. And so for me, this thing, this great project that feminists had engaged in in the decades before I was born 
not only to rebuild an, a new world, you know, not only to leave everything behind, but as you said, um, to disband with patriarchy was, uh, I don't, it rocked me. It was, it, it really stayed with me all these years, this idea that um, leaving patriarchy behind, in other words, could be done in practice, that it wasn't this, it, you know, it wasn't only a concept, it wasn't only a theory, it wasn't only something that we talked about in classrooms or, you know, in our political meetups. It was something that women had done and they had done it in the years before I was born. And so that really piqued my interest. Um, and I can stop talking in a moment, but before I do, I'll say um, that something else that you alluded to is really important for me, which is a sort of, um, not necessarily reclamation, but revisitation of feminist histories that have beget my own history and really thinking through what it is to inherit um, you know, a political ideology, what it is to inherit all the benefits, you know, of the brave people who have come before you and what it is to sort of negotiate the distance between lives. Um, and that sort of, I don't think of it so much as a looking back, but as a reaching towards has been really instrumental in how I think about what artwork, artwork can be, <laughs> my artwork and other people's artwork. Um, and that is a project that is, as an idea is sort of forever unfolding. No, that's great, Carmen. And in fact, this brings me to a number of other questions that are kind of uh, interrelated to your answer that I would like us to further tease out, um, specifically certain issues that have to do with um, the notion of labor and value of authorship and community of identity and identification and of genealogy uh, and the legacy. And regarding the issue of uh, labor and value, if we were to start, in fact, there is one question that very much relates to what I am also going to ask you. And that is the question um, is, uh, let me read it for you. What is the importance of presence and physicality in your work, Carmen. Why make photo books and collages instead of projecting, for example? So I'm going to now weave this into my own uh, work because I think that, um, into my own question, because I think that in your work, you uh, always complicate this distinction between fine art photography, the vernacular, craft, manual labor, and I recall reading in an interview with Aperture where you uh, say that it took you a long time, for instance, to understand that you didn't need to disguise the crafty aspect of your work as for instance, in my birth, which uh, includes like 2000 images that are roughly taped, you know, in this mural tapestry. And, uh, so there was a realization that you don't need to worry that your work would be read as crafty, right? Which also meant feminized. Um, and you often use these books as a source material and you dismantle and you cut them and then uh, you kind of reinvest them with the creation of a new work. Uh, my birth is truly an epic and laborious project. Um, of women preparing for and in the process of labor and childbirth. And, um, you know, it's to me, it's so much that whole project is about labor, right? The labor of a bodily experience that only women have and can perform. And then the labor of assembling and, and redistributing all these images. And, uh, it is in a certain way also one of the most pointed critiques of capitalist economy uh, he, because historically it is grounded in an unequal division of production, um, the bourgeois institution of marriage and of nuclear family that kind of limited opportunities for women in the workplace and exploited uh, the unpaid domestic labor that they performed at home. And that being of course, child uh, birth and child rearing, uh, that these were the most widespread uh, essential labor activities that uh, women carried. 
So can you address a little bit this issue of production and reproduction in your work and how important was it for you that this project was a book, a physical object, rather than as the question from, uh, was rather than a projection. Um, yes, it would imbricate the history of one feminist group with your own. Um, uh, how important was also that this would be circulated on a broader scale than usually an exhibition does? Oh, there are so many good questions in there. I'll try to, I'll try to retain them as I go. Um, Maybe I could start by saying that, yes, what you read in the interview is indeed true. I worked for years making my, I've always been interested in photography and in the photographic object and in sort of its history, how it lives and circulates, how it's made. And for years I made my own photographs and um, I'll spare you sort of the, you know, the trajectory, but ultimately I photographed the photographs. I was sort of, I, I think I was looking for a long time to the sort of point of originality and labor and work, you know, um, towards, towards sort of the idea of the original and the idea of original authorship. Um, and it wasn't until I finally gave myself permission to disband with using the camera and to consider the photographic object itself as um, you know, as something with texture and patina, as something with history that has circulated through different women's hands, oftentimes intergener intergenerationally, um, that I came into something like a practice. Um, and you're right too that I, um, for years, even after sort of coming to that, you know, that realization, that, which was really transformative in its own right, um, I was nervous to transmute my studio workings into the world. I mean, I alluded to liking that T. Corinne photograph of her own studio, which, you know, I had like all these strung up images in which there were piles and piles of photographs because in fact, that's how a lot of studios look. It's certainly how my studio looks. And I had the idea um, that I needed to sort of transmute something that felt otherwise sort of more resolved, sort of glossier, um, more finished. And you're absolutely right that I, I equated so-called craftiness with something that was feminized, with, with the work that women do, with the work that children do. And I didn't take it thereby seriously as the subject of creative or intellectual inquiry. And so that I bring up over and over again, particularly when I talk to students, um, was a process of contending with my own inculcated sexism, you know, and this is, and this is coming from someone who has, you know, been a dedicated feminist and a student of sort of feminist literature for as long as I can remember. So I want to be really sort of honest about what that process was like and what it took. Um, and you're right too, that thinking about labor in all of its forms is really instrumental here. Of course, um, in some ways, it's easier in a project like my birth, which is um, because the, that thing that we're doing, that we're picturing is called labor. Of course, that's the word that we use for pushing out life. Um, and, in, and in working on that project and in doing the arduous collecting and cutting and compounding, of course, there, you know, there were many internalized conversations about what labor looks like, how we qualify it how we remunerate it. At the same time, in fact, I was reading um, Sylvia Federici's, uh, you know, most seminal book, Caliban and the Witch, which for those who are interested or uh, maybe you know, is very much centered. It's a Marxist feminist philosophical understanding of the split between re basically productive labor and reproductive labor. And so thinking about what it, mean, what it meant not only to be making that work, but to be entering it into a kind of commercial space. I mean, granted a museum, you know, it does not belong to the same commercial registers, you know, as a gallery, but okay, circulating it in the, you know, in the same conversations and, and the complications of that, um, you know, was I, in other words, sort of, was that an act of subversion or an act of immersion, you know, or a little bit of both? Um, in regard to the book, um, 
I mean, I mentioned the blatant image, Woman Spirit, and a few other feminist magazines that were circulating at the time that these photographs were made. And that was very much on purpose. Um, the, the sort of cheap, you know, um, printed material and ephemera and magazines, in some cases, books that were being made by these women. I mean, talk about labor, the hand setting, right? Like um, making a book was really a, a different kind of enterprise in, you know, in 1978, let's say. Um, and I was really drawn to um, this idea of a, a book, let's say, printed material really for, I mean, you alluded to this Roxana for how it can circulate for, you know, for how cheap it is to buy and to pass, you know, to pass on that you can put it sort of under your arm or, you know, in your suitcase and take it across oceans. I mean, th this is not an idea that's new to me. Um, it felt like it very much belonged in and resonated with this material in the first place. This is how it lived. It, yes, it lived to a certain extent in these studios. Yes, it lived, you know, in exhibitions, but for the most part, it lived in print material that these women were circulating in the world in some cases um, to recruit, to recruit other women, you know, or to sort of get the word out. And they did that through photographs. Um, so it felt to me that um, to imagine this project as a book felt like the most appropriate thing. That's not to preclude other possibilities. Um, in fact, Carol Newhouse, one of the photographers whose images I showed in the presentation, who has become a dear friend and is a wonderful person and, and a um, really incredible photographer who's never had an exhibition and has worked as a social worker on and off when not living on the land. And I are in the process of potentially imagining her work in or as an exhibition. So it's not to say that it can't have multiple lives, um, but because so much of the material begins that way, I like the idea of a life cycle that it could sort of begin and end as a book. Um, even if those books sort of move, you know, in, in different circles or are sort of across different decades. Mm. I hope I've answered. There were different parts of that question, I know, so I yeah. hope I've touched on no, that. Totally. And in fact, you know, uh, the Ovularis produced a magazine, right? The Blatant Image, uh, which was a magazine of feminist photography too. And it's interesting that you say that it was done also uh, as a means of recruiting other women, of disseminating their, you know, what they were doing there. Um, so, which brings me also a little bit to another question, which is the issue of authorship and, com and community. Uh, because there were just, I think, three issues that were being produced uh, through this publication of uh, the blatant image. And, um, but it was important because they, they had a certain uh, impact, right, in supporting other women photographers. And I think that some of the first images that uh, uh, by Barbara Hammer or even Carrie Mae Weems uh, that they were published there. Uh, and still, um, and still, despite all of this, this group was rather homogeneous in terms of racial and class identity. For instance, there were no black Chicana or Native American feminists or, uh, you know, women included in the ovulars and they were working on occupied land. So that kind of lack of racial di diversity is something that I want to also bring up. Um, so how does a separatist from the patriarchal order community function when it has not dismantled another hegemonic power structure, which is whiteness uh, as its norm. Um, and there is a question here that kind of, I could uh, weave through this, through my question. It, it comes from Flavia Yumi. Um, she asks, um, Flavia asks, do you think Carmen that whenever a male photographer photographs a woman, there is a sexy tenor in the perception and consequently in the result. And I want to kind of complicate uh, this uh, by asking whether the concept of feminism needs to be re-examined even more outside of just the patriarchal um, structure or maybe, or maybe a feminist can can also be a patriarch in a way. You know, you, you, you mentioned just uh, 
just a second ago in your own sexism by thinking that your work was too crafty, too feminized in, in the beginning. And this we all, we are all kind of struggling with because this is learned language, it's inculcated in us, right? So I think, I think that um, feminism needs to be re-examined also for its own racial and colonial imprint. And you, you, you notice and underscore in the book and in the presentation today that most of the attendees were uh, lesbian, that these workshops allowed them to explore uh, their creativity uh, in, in a very supportive women-centered environment. Um, and all the women's uh, lands actively sought to nurture and care for the land rather than extract resources from it or change it, um, their founding was still part of the narrative of settler colonialism in Oregon and in, in the United States. So I would like to answer both this idea of whether you think that uh, every time, you know, that um, that um, a male photographer photographs a woman if there is a sexist tenor. And also uh, the question of whether you think that, um, or you're concerned about the possibility of romanticizing this feminist group, this communal life, despite the difficulties, uh, of course, that they all had from starting from zero and, um, because, you know, in this kind of uh, utopic Arcadia, even if everything is so difficult, the political could be or could get forgotten, might be forgotten. Yes, um, I guess I could take those one at a time. Um, I certainly don't feel as though every photographic projection, you know, by or through a male or male identified photographer um, is inherently sexist, so that was the language. Um, my, um, you know, we're, we're all, all of us sort of nuanced and complicated human beings. Men can certainly be feminists, should be feminists. Um, my interest really lies much more in this question that I, I hope I was that I was at least trying to circle around in that presentation, uh, which is much more the question of, um, let's see, um, well, uh, well, Sophie Hackett said it best when she said, um, does optimism have an aesthetic? And to which I would add, is there a feminist aesthetic? And if this isn't too abstruse, does feminism change the way we see? I mean, this is a question that um, the great writer and thinker of our time, Sarah Ahmed, queer you know, feminist writer and thinker of our time has posed, um, you know, is, is how we become reoriented, um, productively reoriented within our, you know, our political ideals. And, and to which I ask as an artist, and I mean this quite literally, um, does it change how we set pictures up? Does it change how we compose our images, how we formulate them in the studio, how we, how we present them? Um, not necessarily in like um, a didactic sense of like does it does it attend a feminist statement, but something much deeper around um, around sight, in fact, um, and representation and re-representation. Um, so I I you know I wouldn't I wouldn't dare say that um, that a, you know a man photographing is is necessarily or inherently a sexist you know sort of way of seeing. Um, or sort of projection of sight. Um, right, regarding the other question, an interrelated question, um, this is something that, you know, often comes up. I, I've spoken about this project in particular with students, younger students, undergraduate students, which has been really such a compelling and kind of um, eye-opening experience because the first thing that they seize on, that they're interested in and concerned about is um, well the the essentialism you know absolutely of sort of who is allowed and who is disallowed right so at the time although we didn't have the word for it um, trans women you know would likely have depending on the community have been disallowed um, women with male children I have two sons would have been potentially disallowed 
right? So like, what is it to determine, of course, who can be, who can self-identify, who can enter sort of within or without of an exclusive community? So that's one thing I want to take that on, but that's like, that's one thing to consider here. Um, and then of course, as you say as well, a total, and this is, I mean, I'm borrowing from, from Carol Newhouse, with whom I've talked about this with at length, she describes, um, in fact, a pretty robust class consciousness as a lot of the women who were coming in um, were lower middle class, working class. And so there were many conversations, in fact, about, um, yeah, about, about class disparity, um, about wealth, about the sort of the economic systems and sort of the mechanisms of capitalism. But a total, and this is her words again, um, a, a total sort of oversight in and around critical race consciousness, that there were very, very few conversations about that. And of course, race, class, and gender, as we understand, um, are not sort of to be partitioned in terms of our identity, but for the purposes of this conversation, um, it is something that we can't shy away from, right? Both in terms of how these communities functioned who they, whom they reached, who had access to this sort of social alliance network, um, and also who, who exists, you know, as a result, as sort of evidence, proof, subject, you know, of this social experiment, which continues, I think, to yield in lots of different ways. It's not something, maybe we can touch on this in the future, in sort of in the sort of coming moments, but um, I want to make clear that I don't think about this in terms of success and failure while these projects, these social projects for the most part are no longer um, most radical social projects that are coalition based are um, in fact not necessarily designed to succeed in these sort of conventional ways or sort of continue to yield in invisible ways or we can sort of start to think about the women who passed through them, the thousands of women who passed through them, who re-entered, you know, back into the civilian world with a new kind of critical feminist consciousness. So I do, I do want to sort of get a plug in for that, that I think success and failure as a binary doesn't make sense when we're thinking about and talking about these communities. But um, to go back to the point at hand, um, it, it would be, um, it would be sort of foolish. I mean, it's, it's absolutely part of the project, these omissions, right, these um, exclusions and sort of thinking about how feminism, as with all progressive, even radical social movements, um, right, as with gay power, as with black power, makes enormous mistakes and oversights um, in, you know, in sort of the, their own, you know, in their own dedicated and interrelated ways. And so I think it's important at once to acknowledge those and acknowledge them at the outset. And as you say, to inculcate them into the project in some sense, right, into the text, um, into how I talk about the project, into the formulation, you know, of the images that I choose. Um, but also, and at the same time, to understand and appreciate the context in which they were situated. I think it's too easy to dismiss um, what, what we now call second wave feminism, which, which of course was once called women's liberation, uh, right, a, a very, a different end. Um, to sort of dismiss it as uh, being too essentialist or um, sort of not meeting its moment, you know, in regard to say sex positivity. And to me, this is a mistake. Um, I'm really interested in turning it over and over for all of its promise and for all of the ways that it stumbled and sort of understanding that in some sense in and of uh, the moment in which it was situated. Mm. Sorry, I'm outside and so there's some yeah, you have a Halloween noise. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. The context of when something happens, how it happens, matters. Um, but it's also interesting what you said about who could enter this community, who had access to the community. Maybe you wouldn't have had access uh, to it. Um, so this 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 thing makes me think about how. Uh, you know, like like Kasia Silverman, for instance, in the Miracle of Analogy, she she 
she speaks about how every culture actually attempts to colonize the field of vision and how um, to determine, in fact, who is visible, who is invisible, who is allowed to see, who is allowed to be part of a community, what all these notions of vision, you know, also signify. And in fact, it's not surprising because women's early engagement and now to link it back to photography, but their engagement with and access to photography uh, gained by virtue of the medium's own marginality uh, within the arts underscores a more democratic uh, or, or democratic rather relationship between progressive politics and progressive aesthetics. Um, and also an expanded uh, concept of what an artist can be. And it's interesting to look at uh, the work that uh, th these women were producing in the ovulars, how they were subverting also the cliche cult of the master, um, operating in these uh, collective ways in front and behind the camera, photographing the process of, as you mentioned, there were so many photographs of the way that they were photographing, um, doubling, you know, of course, their aesthetic persona simultaneously as co-authors and mothers. And I like this whole idea that photograph that um, that photo that photographic history is peripatetic. You know, they moved there. That, that, that it is connective. That it is interstitial and intersectional. That it is, in fact, generous and porous. Um, but also that it is, and that's what we were just talking right now. And you are trying to 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 explain that it is contradictory, that it is challenging, that it is difficult and sometimes uncomfortable, that we, that we cannot uh, have all the answers right, that there is failure, that there are omissions. So my question is, what is it to you, uh, in fact, feminist photography? Who are your images for? And, and perhaps, you know, since you are also a teacher, how do you teach feminism to your students? You know, um, with what feminism do you identify with? No one has ever asked me that, that first question. I have to think about it. Um, I mean, to return to Sarah Ahmed, I'm thinking of her book now, um, Living a Feminist Life from a few years ago, I think 2017. She writes, um, I'm paraphrasing of course, but she writes of, um, of that to be a feminist is to be a student, is to be a perpetual student. And I think about that often in my life as an artist, um, as a mother, as a professor, these are roles of so-called expertise and sort of what it means taking Ahmed's, you know, taking up from sort of where Ahmed leaves off, what it means to lead with inquiry. Um, and I really mean that in the most direct sense it does it doesn't that doesn't feel like a uh, like a theoretical idea i think about that often in practice and in praxis um and so that means sort of different things and i i hope to circle around to the question of sort of who the images are for um and maybe even tether it if i can if i can be lucid enough tether it to the question of how i teach of course i hope the images are for everybody <laughs> um the study that I have undertaken, I mean, I, I never have taken, I should mention, a feminist studies class. I, I am the daughter of a, of a social scientist. My father is a, a sociologist and my mother works in reproductive health. And so in some sense, um, as I think of myself as a student, right, they're my first teachers. Um, but I have moved through the world working to sort of educate myself perpetually thinking of myself as a student, um, you know, even before I came into Ahmed. Of course, Ahmed also writes so poignantly. Um, she says something along the lines of, um, when did feminism speak to you? When did feminism speak you? And when I read that line, I, um, I really felt it in my body. Uh, because it was it was so accurate. She writes so often of how feminism moves into our bodies, 
Um, and she writes sort of in terms of thinking through our skin and her famous concept of sweaty, her famous idea of sweaty concepts, what it means to negotiate our world um, in uncomfortable ways, um, uncomfortable and productive ways, what it means as she writes, this has become a real Ahmed fest, but a lot of, I, I've been thinking about her lately. Um, what does it mean to be a body who's not at home in the world? And so I think about that often as I'm making my work in terms of whom it is for. So in that sense, and I can use the example of my birth, the installation, that was a project that was for everybody, but it was for everybody and informed by everybody in very different ways. So for example, when I saw women my, of my grandmother's generation moving through it, women who, at least in this country at that time, um, likely experienced uh, a birth in which they were put under twilight sedation, which is just to say they were unconscious and had amnesia, had no memory of the event. Uh, you know, it was sort of shrouded in not only privacy, but um, but shame. Uh, they were told to bind their breasts, um, right? And that breastfeeding wasn't healthy, all, all of these things. So for me, in that sense, with that project, those women informed the work in an entirely different way um, than you know a young teenager who might be moving through with their parent. Um, so I would never say that the work is sort of either for somebody or not for somebody else, but rather that I'm quite sensitive to the ways in which it speaks to and speaks, to quote Ahmed, the bodies that, sort of, that move through it or encounter it um, in different ways. Um, I mentioned earlier regarding this question of um, my life as, as a professor and a teacher. Um, I mentioned in the presentation posing this question to my students, um, you know, around not only this question of what is feminism or what is patriarchy, which are important questions, in fact, to interrogate, um, but uh, can you imagine a world outside of it? What would that look like? Which is particularly difficult, I think, in, in terms of, of the patriarchy, right? We maybe have other economic models um, beyond capitalism that we can look to. And so sort of perpetually um, in the case of the classroom, sort of working to imagine, which of course is the work of artists. It's the work of artists as it is with the work of social activists, right? We both in our own way work to imagine that which does not yet exist. And so who is better posed, uh, poised to do that, you know, to do that imaginative work than artists. So for me, that's like a very interrelated charge. And it makes me feel really excited that I get to be an artist in particular. Like I'm not an art historian. I'm not in comparative studies, right? To be an artist talking to other artists about this. Um, and, and I'll just finally sort of circle back and say that this question of being a student, being a perpetual student and leading with inquiry rather than necessarily with expertise is for me a very feminist project that I work to do across my life, including, you know, as a parent in different ways. No, that's great. And in fact, you just answered one other question that came from one of uh, our listeners, uh, which was, does photography have a social function in your work? How does the social role relate to the visualities of the works which you just basically answered? Um, but this brings me perhaps to, uh, to a final question. Uh, and uh, it has to do with, uh, with the issue of genealogy and legacy. And I want to touch upon something that you uh, haven't spoken too much about, uh, except that you did mention the notion of joy, of optimism. But I wanted to touch on the title of, uh, of this project, Notes on Fundamental Joy. And you mentioned once uh, its long title, which is the elimination of oppression through the social and political transformation of the patriarchy that otherwise threatens to bury us. And it is uh, an intentionally long uh, title. And it made me think of another um, of another feminist project um, with which perhaps you are familiar, and that is Marianne Vex's project, Let's Take Back uh, Our Space, Female and Male Body Language as a Result of Patriarchal Structure, which is a similarly an encyclopedic work, 
uh, of feminist art and cultural history. Um, it's a work that uh, consists of over 200 uh, long panels, each one comprising numerous photographs. So in total, there are thousands of photographs of men and women that uh, Vex uh, took herself in the streets uh, of Hamburg in the 1970s, as well as images that she re-photographed from uh, a variety of uh, sources, from magazine advertisements, art history books, pamphlets, uh, pornography, periodicals, mail order catalogs, and so on and so forth. And we have been talking a lot about um, about women of her generation, and that is a second wave of feminism, which obviously uh, articulated much of the 60s and 70s work. But today, from our perspective today, there is such a broad spectrum of feminisms. And because it cannot really be uh, easily defined or categorized, what would you say that uh, will be 21st century's feminism most salient legacy for future generations? It's such a good question and it's such an impossible question, of course. <laughs> um, I have my own affinities um, in and around, you know, sort of the workings of what I think of as, um, you know, effective, um, or generative feminist practice. But I just wanna start out by saying um, that of course, those are proclivities. Those are sort of my, you know, my own, um, my own ideas informed by my own experience, you know, um, and my own, and, and I can acknowledge my own and should acknowledge my own privilege. So, you know, I, I wanna start by saying that there can and should be different perspectives about where feminism is going as with any social movement social you know axioms change and revolt against themselves you know and we should it is incumbent upon us to be responsive i don't think um, again as with any social movement that feminism should be fixed in place um, that said, there are certain, uh, I think it won't be a surprise, there are, you know, sort of certain values within women's liberation that I aspire to, that I find quite brave, for lack of a better wor word, and, you know, we've been talking at length about one of them today, which is the daring to imagine that another world was possible, of course, as, as we've spoken about, calling a movement women's liberation is to insist that you are not just oppressed but enslaved and so the idea and you can hear it and you know and and read it in the writings of kate millett and andrew dworkin and mary daly and jermaine greer and you know all the sort of um adrian rich you know the, the feminist audrey lord of this, of this generation is um not only a desire to sort of overturn not symbolically, um, you know, but quite concretely overturn the social order um, and a belief that that overturning was possible. And I feel disheartened. <laughs> um, again, I hesitate to sort of speak for a whole generation, right? But I feel disheartened at the ways in which feminism to my mind has become sanitized. Uh, we no longer speak of liberation. You know, we no longer speak of universal childcare. We no longer speak of, um, you know, uh, women at home getting 401ks, right, as with wages for housework or something um, that feels so foreclosed. And so um, there's something radical, I think, that has left the building and that I, I clearly am interested in and aspire towards in my work and in my life. Now, at the same time, in ways that we've spoken about, there were immense problems, right, which we can now name as a lack of intersectional understanding or appreciation. I mean, Betty Friedan, you know, famously told the lesbians, famously called the lesbians in the movement a, a lavender menace because they were sort of getting in the way of the straight women, right? It's an old age old story. Of course, we're 100 years into women's suffrage and we're finally talking about the ways in which black women, you know, didn't get the didn't get the franchise. And so, 
it's not news, um, but this, I, I suppose, harkens back to what we were talking about earlier, how to negotiate with a movement that was so socially brave and profound, and at the same time, so profoundly imperfect. Um, and so for me, that is the work, not to overlook it, not to pretend that those contradictions don't exist, and at the same time, in no way to write it off wholesale. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is, um, well, I'll refer to a piece that I wrote for Aperture a few years ago now called Our Bodies Online. It was the original title of that piece was um, um, something funnier that I'm forgetting now having to do with our bodies, ourselves online. In any case, um, I, I called up in that work, uh, the feminist text by Bell Hooks called Feminism is for Everybody, which some people might be familiar with, um, in which she very clearly delineates the boundaries between I don't know if she would call it this, but feminist and not feminist, saying things like, if you don't believe in and support reproductive rights, you are not a feminist, for instance. That is a stance that I think would be very unpopular today. So one of the things that I um, am always sort of thinking about interrogating in my work and again in my life is what are the boundaries of feminism, of contemporary feminism? And I would argue that um, that it's it's quite unpopular to even raise that question in the first place and there is an idea with whatever sort of moment that we're in whatever you want to call it fourth wave feminism post feminism some of my students call it um that there are as many feminisms as there are women um, and feminism is whatever you want it to be um and while I understand the promise of that as it branches off from certain thinkings in th around critical intersectionality um it, it's also, I think, quite politically dangerous and um, threatens to dilute a movement, as with any movement, right, as with Occupy, as with Black Lives Matter, um, there need to be uh, centralized sort of political points of agenda. And so I think the thing that we're negotiating now as feminists of a certain generation <laughs> is um, how at once to take stock of all the different feminists, all the different experiences, how intersectional we are and how much those intersectionalities matter while sort of at the same time doing the work that Bell Hooks draw, you know, drew up now some 20 years ago um, around, um, you know, well, what are the boundaries, you know, of, of what we stand for and how not to atomize, um, you know, as a movement, as an intersectional movement that's that's a hard <laughs> that's a hard thing to do and i the short answer is that i subscribe to a, a more sort of radical feminist even marxist tradition but i i understand that that is not you know that's that doesn't sort of do it for everybody so i think the larger question is is the one posed just before that well um Carmen, uh, it was such a conversation with you over all of this um i uh, I think we are at the end of uh, our time. Uh, so thank you so much for the gift of this uh, conversation. Thank you so much. I so, as I, I know I mentioned this earlier, but I can't stress it enough, Roxana. Um, I, I'm so honored to be in conversation with you and your work has been so meaningful for me over the years in different ways. So I hope to continue the conversation beyond, um, beyond this contagious world. <laughs> I look very much forward to it, Carmen. Thank you, for everyone, for joining us today. Bye. Obrigado, Carmen. Uh, obrigado, Roxana. Obrigado às duas por serem uh, excelentes convidados. Vocês já se adiantaram e se despediram. Eu ia entrar justamente para começar a encerrar a mesa, uh, agradecer vocês e falar para todo o público que está assistindo, agradecer o público também e avisar a todos que a gente continua hoje no Festival Zoom, é às cinco, logo mais, uh, com o Tiago Nogueira, editor da Zoom, conversando com Alfredo Jaar, na mesa chamada A Política da Imagem, e domingo, né, amanhã, às três da tarde, a gente tem A Violência Latina, com a artista Teresa Margolis conversando com a Gabriela Rangel, é, diretora do Malba, em Buenos Aires, e às cinco a gente fecha o festival amanhã com a mesa Contra o Novo Fim do Mundo, o artista Danilson Baniwa conversa com Ailton Krenak. Ah, então tem muita coisa boa ainda pela frente, mais uma vez eu agradeço imensamente a vocês duas, Roxana, Carmen, Foi muito bom, uh, uma pena que a gente tem que encerrar. Uh, espero vê-las por aqui novamente em breve. Obrigado.